No. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming for the next Ipanema Scientific Online Lecture that will be given by Professor Gordana Vunjak Novakovic from the Columbia University. And she will tell us about microfluidics in tissue engineering. So, Gordana, please. Thank you so much, Ivana. It's, it's uh, really wonderful to be with you in these Zoom times. Um, and also, as I was listening to introductions, it is great feeling how small the world is, because I seem to be connected to many of you and to all of your institutions. I mean, I come from Belgrade originally, um, I, where many of you are from. I met Ivana when she was a Fulbright Fellow at Columbia. We started to work together many years ago, and this continues. Um, I was at the time visiting professor at Ben Gurion, have a lot of friends there, a lot of connections, also visiting professor in Wageningen. And one of my memories is that I was biking to work and I was always getting these warnings that there is like a steep hill that I should be mindful of. And I never discovered where is this, like in Netherlands, <laughs> you know, this, the definition of slope is very different than in the rest of the world. So it's great to be here. Um, I will talk about the microfluidics in tissue engineering. Tissue engineering is really what I do for a very long time now, like almost, uh, just a second. Uh, okay, almost uh, 30 years. So let me just recap what tissue engineering is overall. Um, it started some 35 years ago or so with the idea that um, uh, the best replacements for our damaged tissues or organs would be the biological substitutes of these tissues. So this was the time when somehow the stem cell sciences, biomaterial sciences and engineering converged and became ready to work together towards generating tissues in laboratory following some biological principles. So the paradigm is really illustrated here in this cartoon. So there are three key components in any tissue engineering recipe. One are the cells. In most cases, these are some kind of stem cells, not always, because we also use engineering systems to study pathogens and we use tissue engineering uh, bioreactors, for example, for some lower organisms. But let's say if you talk about human tissues, which I'll be talking about today, then we use some kind of an adult stem cell that you normally derive from blood. Uh, the whole concept of tissue engineering is to use two components to really assist the cells uh, in doing what they would normally do in the body, which is to make and remodel tissues. One component is the uh, biomaterial that we like to call the scaffold, by analogy to the scaffolding for a building. So this is a temporary support for a structure being formed that is then removed. In tissue engineering, this removal happens by degradation of the scaffold material. The other component, and this is what we will be talking in part about today, is the culture system or bioreactor. So this is a substitute body. This is the component that actually provides the environmental control and important regulatory factors. Obviously, these components, scaffold and bioreactor, will be very different for different issues. And then if you combine them the right way, the conditions are right, you can get either pieces of tissues or there are also some attempts at um, regenerating the entire organs. This is the mainstream of tissue engineering. Some maybe eight or ten years ago, another area um, evolved, which is called, we can call it microfluidics, we can call it organs on a chip. Essentially, um, the same principles are used to make very small tissues human tissues of different kinds in very large numbers, connecting them into physiological units so that you can mimic some of the physiological pro uh, processes. So you can study diseases, you can study inflammation, you can study wound healing, you can study lots of different things. 
So I'll talk only about this other area, about the microfluidics, or they're called organ sonar chip, they're called microphysiological systems. But essentially the motivation for starting this area, which is another uh, branch of the, of the field of tissue engineering, is the fact that drug development is today one of the least efficient and most expensive technologies that we have. It takes a very long time to develop a drug and bring it to the market through the testing. And the yield is very low, as you can see from these numbers. So on average, only one drug out of 10,000 candidates really makes it to the market, to the patients, and stays there. It's not being recalled. So there are many reasons to this, and one of those is that actually the preclinical models uh, for drug testing, this is where the screening happens, uh, are not accurate, they're not predictive enough of human situation. And when we talk about uh, preclinical models, we mean two things. It may be a culture of human cells, or it may be an animal model, typically a mouse. So what happens is that sometimes uh, these models just pass some drugs, uh, they declare them safe, the drugs go into the patients, and this is where the problems begin. On the other hand, you have uh, false negatives, so it happens that actually some drugs show some effects in a mouse, and it turns out that they may, may be actually safe and beneficial in higher organisms. So, I mean, the system doesn't work very well. So this is when the National Institutes of Health started an initiative, uh, invited the scientific community to look into making human tissue models as preclinical models for drug testing. This is how the whole area actually evolved. And here is a little cartoon uh, from these early times. Uh, one of the groups that really truly pioneered the effort was the group of Don Ingber in Boston. And this is a little schematic that just shows what we mean by organs on a chip or microphysiological systems. You have tissues representing different organs in our body that are connected in a way they would be connected in the body. This is not a body in the chip. On the chip, you will never have all organs. You usually have fewer than shown here, but you do, um, uh, you do simulate or model one particular physiological function. And then depending on this function, I'll show you some examples, you will make selection of the organ systems and arrange them in a particular order. So what do, we, what do we ask when we are designing these systems? First of all, they need to be modular and configurable. So you should be able to arrange, let's say, bone module and liver module and lung module in an order that you like. You may change the ratio between the amount of liver per unit amount of lung or unit amount of bone or skin. This is very important, configurability. Um, it is a must that you have stable tissue phenotypes, and if you are talking about uh, modeling diseases and testing drugs, then what pharmaceutical industry is asking for is to maintain tissues for weeks to months. Uh, four weeks is somehow adopted as a minimally acceptable uh, duration of these studies. Otherwise, it's very difficult to get uh, to, to recapitulate the progression of disease or regeneration. In an ideal world, you would like to have the individual control of tissue compartments because each of these tissues um, requires different medium supplements, different cytokines, growth factors, and other factors, different physical and other stimuli. So this individual control, which goes back to this modularity, configurability, so controlling them individually, local control, and then connections into more global units, this is really how it works. Uh, it is very advantageous if you can look into the function, for example, response to 
drugs or environmental signals or pathogens or whatever you measure online, which means in a non contact mode, for example, using um, labeled cells, cell reporters, for example, that these cells would start shining green when something is really happening, or you can take videos, or you can take samples of culture medium for metabolic assays. So then you can do a longitudinal study, and you can also do dynamic studies. This is very important and brings a lot of value to your experiment. And finally, for uh, studies of human physiology, of any kind, it is, it is often advantageous to have patient-specific platforms so that certain diseases that are very uh, dependent on the individual genetic makeup and uh, the overall systemic conditions, the state of health or disease, for these diseases, cancer is one example, inflammation is another example. It is, a, it is very convenient if you can study them um, in a patient uh, specific, in the individualized co uh, context. So uh, one of the platforms, this is the one that we uh, are studying in our laboratory is shown here very schematically. So what you see here, if you look at the bottom first is you have a number of tissue compartments and these are just examples. So you can combine, uh, sorry, a set of tissues. Each of them is individually controlled. And then we have this loop that goes around. This is where microfluidics comes into the place. So this is this perfusion that actually mimics the blood flow in the body. And these tissues talk to each other through signals that are released into the perfusion and taken from the perfusion. So this is the feature that we really try to recapitulate. And then on the top, you see the top view of this platform. So this here is the reservoir. It really like corresponds to this figure. And then you have different tissue compartments. And to get a sense of a size, I mean, you see at the right the photo. So this is the size of a microscope slide. So you can package say five tissue systems or more on one, slide. So the footprint is a microscope slide. And a little bit like a few more views. So this is the top view, the bottom view where you just see this um, endothelialized surface uh, where the perfusion is. And then on the right, you see that we assemble this platform. It's actually relatively easy. You first uh, place into it this um, insets with endothelium and then you start parking different tissue modules into it. And then when all this is assembled, you start perfusion. You can make any configuration that you like. We have done a lot of good studies just using two tissue modules, for example, liver and heart, liver to metabolize drug and uh, heart as a target of a lot of drug toxicity just an example, or you may have something very, very complex like this here, which you do either because you need more tissue modules or you need to vary the ratios between the tissue volumes. So for example, I may need to have four liver compartments per two heart compartments, etc. So you do have this configurability which comes very conveniently. And finally, I mentioned patient specificity. So this is something that was actually very difficult to do. We didn't develop all these protocols. We uh, adopted them and adapted them, but it took us years to come to this point that human-induced pluripotent stem cells, these are Yaman cells. These are the cells that are uh, derived from an adult, but they do have lots of the properties of embryonic cells, which means they can give rise to a number of different cell types and make, say, different types of cells such as cardiomyocytes, endothelial cells, and fibroblasts that go into the heart tissue, and then hepatocytes and supporting cells in liver, et cetera. So the point is you can, when needed, derive all these tissues from the same source. 
This is a menu of options as we have it at this time. So, so far we are able to make sensory neurons, heart muscle, bone. Um, very recently we, were, we also incorporated bone marrow compartment, which is very important for homeostasis and physiological control. We have liver, we have vasculature, tumor tissue, skin, muscle also with motor neuron. So this is, I'll show you this example. So these are the two units connected and circulating immune cells. So uh, this is an example of how you make tissue before you place it into the platform. So for example, for the bone tissue, we would start again from IPS cells and then we would derive mesenchymal cells. So these are the uh, cells that normally in our body give rise to bone, cartilage and fat. And we would um, uh, uh, seed these cells into the scaffolds that we make out of mineralized bone meat. Matrix. So this is a native bone matrix, which has all the signals that are needed for these cells to turn into osteoblasts, into the bone forming cells. Uh, this uh, selection of the scaffold is very important because with this scaffold, we are able to make bone without addition of the growth factors. So you don't need to use BMPs, bone morphogenic proteins that are normally used. The scaffold itself will communicate with the cells and guide them into differentiating into the right cell types. Bone uh, has more cell types than just osteoblasts. Our bones are actually maintained healthy by constantly breaking down the existing material and building new one. The cells that break bone are osteoclasts. They come from a completely different source. They come from monocytes. So we needed to derive monocytes from the same IPS cells that we use for osteoblasts and then place them into the bone. And if you have this situation, then you can have formation of reasonably nice bone tissue which actually turned out to be uh, very useful, for example, for modeling of cancer metastasis, for testing some of the drugs, for modeling osteoporosis, et cetera. A skin is the work of our colleague uh, who is on the same project, Angela Cristiano. And this is a very, very nice um, a model that they have developed, so their skin is is made out of cells, as you see here at the right, with like layers, so you have epidermis, you have dermis, and then the skin can be vascularized, can be uh, contain pigment, which is important, um, it has immune cells, is innervated and is responding to stimuli. For example, skin is very important in studies of pain. And then it has so-called appendages in simple, English, this is the hair, and so they were able to also generate hair that you see here. So there is a follicle, and then there is this hair stem coming out of, uh, of a follicle. So this is maybe a good uh, example to say that you will always use only as much complexity as you need. Like the whole tissue engineering is somehow motivated by this question, how simple is complex enough? And the answer is, it really depends what you're studying, but you will not necessarily go through the trouble of regenerating all these components if the biology that you're studying doesn't need them. Neuromuscular junction that I mentioned to you. So in, this is something that we have in our body in very large numbers. So you have a motor neuron which couples to the skeletal muscle. So this motor neuron is actually bringing signals to the muscle and causing the muscle to twitch. Um, there are diseases like sp spinal muscular atrophy or, and some others where actually the dysfunction of this junction is causing disconnect between the nerve and muscle and muscle is not working because the uh, work of the skeletal muscle is not spontaneous it is actually driven by these electrical signals from the motor neuron. 
So this microfluidic fluidic system that you see here, which is really very nice and elegant, it was developed by a former postdoc called Laya Villa, um, it has two different tissues, if you like. One is the, uh, uh, sorry, the motor neuron that is formed uh, from neurospheres and uh, these neurospheres are extending axons that are coupling to this muscle which is made out of muscle cells. We made, as I mentioned, both of these cell types from the same source. What was a nice touch in this study is that Olaya, when she started deriving uh, neural cells from the same source of cells as muscle, she actually, before neural differentiation, she um, optogenetically edited these cells so that they are light sensitive. And then you have this situation that you see here in the middle. So there are axons, there is this neurosphere that's optically sensitive, and there is a muscle that's not optically sensitive. So if you shine light, which is the right wavelength to actually excite this channel rhodopsin that you gene edited into the cell, then the neuron will be firing. And if you see that the muscle is, uh, sorry, that the muscle is uh, uh, twitching, then you know that the connection works. So this is how the whole system works. So here it's a little bit difficult to see. So we have this microfluidics here. You are shining light with the laser, very tightly controlled wavelength. And here on the screen, I think you can see there is this muscle that is twitching under certain conditions. So uh, what you see here is how it really looks after a while. Uh, some time of culture. Green is nerve, like this, like orange red colors, stains are muscle. And what Olaya uh, did to show utility of this model is she made the cultures of oh, healthy, healthy, sorry? Okay, healthy neuromuscular junctions. And then in some of them, uh, she added a normal human blood serum from a healthy individual. And what happens here is that actually as the uh, light is shining, you have these signals and then you see that each signal is followed or most of them are followed by a capture. So the yield is about 78, 80%. Uh, when she did parallel cultures of the same muscle, adding uh, 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 serum from patients with myasthenia gravis, so this is one of these diseases that actually are described by dysfunction of neuromuscular junction, there was no capture. So you see signals here at the bottom picture, but no capture. And then what you see at the right is actually the comparison of the uh, yield of uh, 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 pulses, so how many pulses, uh, how many times uh, the, the muscle responded to the, uh, to the stimulation. You see that uh, it is for the control and for, for a healthy serum, there is a good response here in the middle is the disease serum, there is no response. When you wash away serum, then you have response again. So it's really working very nicely and we are now start using this model. We are studying it for SMA and some other conditions. It's really very nice, a relatively high throughput microfluidic uh, uh, system. So, uh, so th the next thing I would like to show you uh, just briefly is uh, just how we form one of the tissues. So if any of you is really interested in detail, so I will talk a little bit about the heart muscle and I will refer to two papers that are available online. Uh, one of them is really describing the methodology and its scientific premise, and the other is the protocol paper that gives uh, all details of cell preparation, how you, how you make cells, how you may uh, form tissues, how do you condition and mature these tissues, how do you analyze 
their functionality. And in parallel with making cells in tissues, how do you make these microfluidic platforms? So this is how it looks. So the platform is really based, if you look into this image here, on, um, on uh, forming a tissue between two pillars. You see here is the tissue, you have it here also enlarged. So these are the cells in collagen or fibrin gel. And uh, this tissue is then electrically stimulated uh, using signals that mimic those in the native heart. And what happens is that in response to this electrical stimulus, the cells twitch in sync, like our heart is twitching. And as they twitch, they pull these pillars. So this is a sort of work against force. This work is causing organization and alignment of this tissue. So this is the working principle. And in this particular case, you have a chamber with, uh, you have a platform with 16 chambers, all of which are populated by heart muscles on these pillars, and each row of these uh, uh, chambers or each individual chamber, we can do it either way, is separately controlled and separately stimulated electrically. In these studies, we also developed something that may be interesting, maybe for some of your other studies. We made a, this is a homemade electrical stimulation system. Electrical stimulators are very expensive. So we used to buy them for like five or $10,000 a piece. And this is something that we made, it's very like a laboratory level. This is just a breadboard. And we made this system that is super cheap and uh, super easy to use. And in this protocol paper, you can find not only all components and their sources and how to assemble them, but also we have a lot of MATLAB codes that you can use for analysis of um, electrical responses of the cells uh, if you are studying these kinds of cells and you are interested in this. So this is, as I showed, how we form the heart muscles. So cells are placed into the hydrogel. Hydrogel, uh, actually, as it's losing water over the first few days, it forms tissue in form of this dog bone. You see this tissue here at the top right, uh, twitching, uh, contracting microscopically in response to electrical stimuli. And then we have done a lot of analysis that I will not go into now, I just want to mention that actually this kind of protocol resulted in um, a maturation of the tissues at multiple levels, molecular, for example, if you analyze gene expression in this tissue, so this would be like this row here, the last row in the first group, and you compare it to fetal human heart tissue and adult human heart tissue, you see that actually it is moving from fetal to adult uh, quality of the tissue. If you look into the structure, this is probably much easier to follow. Here are two pictures. One picture is of the internal structure of the cell. Our muscle cells in the heart and also muscle cells in the skeleton are characterized by this accordion-like structure, which is called sarcomere. So this is the structure that is actually contracting. This is the structure that is responding to electrical stimuli and causing muscle to twitch. So you see that this structure is very nicely organized here. And take my word that this is uh, this is uh, resembling uh, many of the properties of the actual heart muscle in our body. And these blobs that you see here organized in like in this uh, rows are mitochondria. So this is the energy factory of the cell. If you see this mitochondria being large, and if you see them in large numbers, this means that the cell is very actively uh, 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 metabolizing, that the respiration rate, the oxygen utilization rate is very high. 
what you see at the right is a cross section through the muscles. So the red are the bodies of the muscle cells, and then the green are the membranes. And then you see that actually this muscle is organized as a bundle of fibers. And here, just looking into, into function after four weeks of culture, to recap just very briefly, these cells have electrical response in form of action potential that has the right shape um, and the right amplitude, so uh, the, the, the voltage. Uh, the cells have uh, oxidative metabolism which is very important because fetal metabolism is glycolytic and these cells switched very quickly during early stages of culture to aerobic metabolism, which is much more efficient, which allows them to make more energy per unit nutrient and unit time and respond, do this work against pillars in response to stimulation. I mentioned that mitochondrial density is very high. It is actually in, uh, in normal range. Um, oops. And at the end, I mean, this is like maybe a little bit disconnected, but even a specifically asked me to, to say something about exosomes. She told me that you are interested in them. So I will tell you, um, just show you three slides from a study that we have done a couple of years ago and that motivated us to now study very extensively exosomes uh, in this organs on a chip in our microfluidic uh, devices. So what we heard down at that time was, is shown here on this schematic. To step back just for a moment, um, how our heart uh, contains cells, cardiomyocytes, that do not have ability to regenerate. They don't grow, they don't proliferate in any like, uh, uh, significant uh, amounts. So they're able to maintain heart as long as heart is healthy, but uh, say after myocardial infarction, when there is a damaged area with dead cells and formation of a scar, heart itself doesn't have enough capacity to self-repair. This uh, caused actually the development of a number of different treatment options. And one of them that's uh, is being studied very, very actively is cell therapy of the heart. So the idea is that if the heart is damaged, you would place a patch of uh, uh, heart tissue that is grown from human cells in laboratory or uh, a patch consisting of hydrogel and encapsulated cells. And then these cells that have ability to couple among themselves and with the native tissue will actually cause uh, drive some level of remodeling of the heart. So this is like the principle of the cell therapy. Uh, however, cell therapy is not easy. There are many issues, including, uh, for example, either the need to use allo allogeneic cells, cells from another individual, or to wait for a very long time until you derive iPS cells and then you derive cardiomyocytes from these cells. Also, the regulatory process for any cell therapy is very long with a very good reason because you really need to show very rigorously that the therapy is safe and effective. And there are also some problems that were noticed in many of these studies, for example, arrhythmia that follows the injection or implantation of the cells. So uh, one alternate idea is that uh, we do not use cells uh, for cell therapy, but we use the factors that they secrete. Because there is a lot of evidence, experimental evidence that suggests that the cells really act on repair, any effects of the repair uh, uh, can be largely attributed to the secreted factors. Uh, 
So this is what, what we have done in this experiment. So we started from iPS cells, we derived cardiomyocytes from these iPS cells, and then we let them secrete the exosomes. Exosomes are very small particles that are, they are nano-sized particles around 100 nanometers in diameter, and they are packed with um, uh, 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 bioactive molecules in the first place microRNAs, but also other proteins, lipids, and other molecules. So this is this cargo that is really of interest. So the idea is, let's uh, use the cells, the same cells that we showed in vitro, uh, having the ability to form very uh, very uh, a functional heart muscle, let's use these cardiomyocytes as factories of exosomes and then encapsulate these exosomes into controlled release patch. We use the collagen-based patch and put this patch with exosomes onto the infarct area and not the patch with the cells and see what happens. So we have done, first step was to do an animal study to see does the concept work at all. Here is a schematic. So we have these uh, uh, iPS cells from which we derived cardiomyocytes. And then cardiomyocytes were allowed to secrete exosomes that we packaged into this controlled release patch. As a control, we also studied exosomes that are secreted by iPS cells and package them into the patch. So the blue group is the cardiomyocyte exosome group. The orange group is the iPS cells exosome group. And then you have a couple obligatory controls. So one control is, this was done in a red model. One control was just to induce myocardial infarction by ligation, by closing one of the big blood vessels in the left ventricle and don't do anything. So this would be, like the natural progression of myocardial infarction if untreated. And then we had a control that, sorry, this first that I was showing was a control with the collagen patch alone and no exosomes to see the effect of biomaterial. This here is actually the, uh, what I just described, ligation not treated in any way and followed. And the third control is so-called sham. So in all animal studies, you go through the motions without doing anything. So you open the animal and then wait for the period of time that you normally use to implant these patches and then close animal to exclude any compounding effects of, uh, of the procedure itself. And what you see here at the right is actually interesting because it shows you sham is normal control. And then you have untreated myocardial infarction, which looks really bad. You have the group with, with the uh, empty patch, which looks pretty much equally bad. And then you have iPS exosomes, not much effect. And then cardiomyocyte secreted exosomes, which appear to have an effect. So we don't know at this point if this is if this patch is preventing the heart damage or also treating the heart damage. But the reality is that actually these animals after at the end of the study had heart in a much better condition. We also did a lot of ultrasound and other studies to show ejection fraction and other measure other parameters. And so this was really corroborated by, uh, by the uh, functional data. And this is really interesting. Uh, here at the left, you see this regenerated or um, uh, it's either regenerated muscle at the infarct site or uh, prevented uh, damage at the infarct site. But the result is actually it looks pretty good uh, if in the group that received exosomes. These exosomes, as you see here, were released uh, over the period of at least three weeks out of four weeks of the study. And uh, there, were, there was no arrhythmia 
uh, uh, that was associated with exosomes. And the two graphs at the right are actually the most interesting because when we looked, uh, when we did analysis of these exosomes, we looked into, into two, um, uh, into two uh, parameters. One was the abundance. So how much of specific molecules, specific microRNAs that we were focused on, you have in cardiomyocyte exosomes relatively to iPS exosomes. And then you see here this shaded gray and like labeled right here, the microRNAs that are most abundant. I mean, like six to a tenfold increase over what you have in, um, in uh, uh, iPS cells. And here, we did another analysis, which is which of these microRNAs are most differentially expressed in, IP, in um, uh, cardiomyocyte uh, exosomes. And it's very interesting that uh, first, there is a lot of overlap between these two groups. So the ones that are most uh, present are also uh, most differentially expressed. And when you look more closely into what are these microRNAs that are either cardiogenic or vasculogenic. So we are now uh, really uh, looking into, into the roles of exosomes much more closely, both in animal studies and also in tissue platforms. And I just want to make one final comment, which is that uh, in tissue platforms, as well as in animals, exosomes are not only therapeutic, they are excellent biomarkers. They're the signals from the cell that tell you what is the status of the cell? How is the cell feeling? Is the cell healthy or diseased? Is it injured? Is it under stress? So you can get a lot of readouts just analyzing these microparticles that are secreted into medium and collected uh, relatively easily. So let me close um, just a few comments. Um, one is talking about tissue engineering, which is the very broad context of this talk. I think it's important to keep in mind that the cells are the actual tissue engineers. We are just helping them by providing the right environment through the tools that we design. Organ stoner chip or microfluidic devices are very important for tissue engineering because they are really a fast track application for this field. They got into application very quickly compared in particular to regenerative therapies and there are many, many pharmaceutical companies around the world that are adopting these systems for um, modeling of diseases and testing of drugs. They allow modeling of human physiology and health and human physiology and disease. They can be patient specific. So these are all very important features. However, this is work in progress. Uh, there are many challenges. One of them is very technical, but important for ph pharmaceutical industry. Um, it is still difficult to combine high biological fidelity, which means like high data output with the high throughput. So they usually go in different directions and um, the field is still figuring out how to reconcile these two. There is also a lot of effort to assist in, this, in data analysis by artificial intelligent, intelligence methodologies. So the different fields are really converging to the benefit of testing. Uh, 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 de uh, develop, uh, make growing mature tissue phenotypes remains a challenge. So we are doing much better than fetal quality, but we are not at the level of real mature human phenotype. And validation of these systems is also work in progress. You do need to validate them against clinical data and show that what you are measuring is meaningful. So at the very end, I mean, this is the lab. This was in the happy times when we were like normal people, you know, working in lab. And uh, so everything that they uh, told you about was actually done by this group. 
um, I also acknowledge the funding sources. And this is the more recent pictures. This is our COVID reality that we live in, which is much worse in the United States than in Serbia. And I think Portugal and Israel and any other country that you can name in the world. And this is one of our recent lab meetings. Uh, it's encouraging that people are still smiling, but they are challenges of getting the work done and staying connected without, with very limited um, access to the experimental facilities. So thank you so much. And if you have time, I'll be, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay. Um, thank you, Gordana, so much. Um, just before I stop the recording, I just wanted to say uh, why I actually specifically asked you also to, to say about the exosomes, because in the Panema project, uh, we would like to use these uh, isothermal amplification methods, so as PCR alternatives, to try and uh, detect the microRNA that are in the exosomes. So that is that was the connection. That's so. great. That's great. And I mean, I'll be I'll be happy to talk more about this because uh, about the experimental protocols we use and mm -hmm. any other details that may be helpful. This is a different method than right. You don't use this yes. method. Okay. It's so important. Just a second, I will stop now uh, the recording. Okay. <laughs>